uh, your spring break and, and your week off, and you're, you're doing this uh, out of the kindness of your heart. So um, I'll shut up and, and let you get going. Thanks, Al. Yeah, it's our spring break, but we had snow last night, so it certainly doesn't feel like I'm giving up much to be here with you this morning. <laughs> but uh, thanks for the invitation to join you. This is my first time doing this sort of thing, so hopefully I won't run into too many technical problems. And the good news for me is that if I put you to sleep, I'll never know. So I'm going to share with you some highlights of my analysis of the Vortex 2 storm that was intercepted on June 5th, 2009 in Goshen County, Wyoming. I don't think I'm being overly hyperbolic in saying that this is uh, likely the best observed tornadic supercell in history. And it's work that uh, kept me busy for much of 2010, 11, and 12. So I'm going to start with a quick overview of what we know about tornado genesis in supercell storms. In supercell environments, there's large vertical wind shear. So this means uh, large velocity differentials. It could be in speed or direction or both uh, in the vertical. And this implies that there's large horizontal vorticity in the environments of supercell. So what this is showing is how uh, vorticity would vary along a trajectory that would go into the updraft of a supercell storm. So the blue line here is a trajectory. And these black arrows with kind of the curled broader arrows around them represent the orientation of the vorticity vector. So the vorticity vector points uh, in such a way that if you put your thumb, uh, if you align the thumb on your right hand with the direction of the vorticity vector, your fingers, if you kind of make a, a curl with them, the, the curl of your fingers gives the sense of spin about this axis. So the vertical shear in the environment of supercells implies horizontal vorticity in that environment. And uh, that horizontal vorticity that each parcel of air can be envisioned as having, as those parcels of air ride up into the supercell storm, the horizontal vorticity becomes vertical. and uh, this is ultimately what gives rise to the rotational loft in supercell. So when you see a supercell with this striated uh, appearance, which takes little imagination to see the rotation, really what you're seeing is the aggregate effects of uh, millions of air parcels that have this horizontal vorticity, and that horizontal vorticity becomes vertical as the parcels of air get swept upward into the storm. Now, one uh, Issue with making a tornado, let me go back a slide, there we go. One issue with making a tornado is this process by itself actually can give us the rotational off, but it can't actually lead to a tornado at the surface. And that's because if you notice, air parcels as they glide upward into this updraft, the rotation within those parcels is only becoming vertical as parcels are rising away from the ground. So right at the ground, the vorticity vector is always going to be horizontal no matter what. And that's not what a tornado is. A tornado is extreme vertically oriented vorticity that extends all the way to the surface. So this process of tilting of vorticity by an updraft alone can't actually make a tornado. So some people might ask, well, what if the tilting is a bit more extreme than what was shown in the previous image. So in the previous image, we saw kind of this gentle up glide of air parcels into the mid-level updraft of a rotating thunderstorm. What if air that's spinning horizontally in the far field approaches something really uh, obstacle-like, either a, a physical barrier or the gust front of a thunderstorm? Uh, could that actually tilt the vorticity much more abruptly so that right near the ground we have in, in, intense vertical vorticity or rotation about a vertical axis? The problem with this mechanism, and I've tried to make a tornado this way in simulation, it just doesn't work. Uh, what ends up happening is that air, in order to turn abruptly upward at the obstacle or the sharp gust front, it has to decelerate and then turn upward. And the deceleration process results in compression of the horizontal vorticity 
that you have far upstream. So no matter how strong you make the horizontal vorticity upstream, you could even make it essentially tornado strength horizontal vorticity upstream, which you might think would give you a tornado if you could just simply tip it upright. But what happens is that air, as air decelerates, as it approaches the obstacle, that horizontal vorticity is decreased tremendously. Uh, might only be five to ten percent of its value right at the gust front as it is far upstream. So that's due to a compression effect. It's essentially the opposite of the, the figure skater effect or the stretching effect that intensifies spin. This is the opposite of that. It's, it's vorticity compression. So you do tilt the vorticity vector abruptly upward, but the magnitude of the vorticity ends up being tiny. And, uh, and then you don't really recover the strong vorticity or the strong spin that you had far upstream, you don't really recover that as strong vertical spin until air is ascended pretty high above the ground near the top of the uh, obstacle, or the, in this case, it's shown as a gust front. So this mechanism just doesn't work, actually, for making a tornado. So what we actually end up needing to make a tornado is a downdraft. We have to have air descend as it approaches the ground. And here's one example of this. This is showing now this blue trajectory is, uh, is the path that a parcel of air might take through the downdraft of a thunderstorm. And let's suppose that upstream there's horizontal vorticity like this, like we, what we saw before. And this horizontal vorticity, as it descends in the downdraft, it gets tipped downward and then it levels off, and then it goes upward again. And you might be thinking, well, okay, you've got a downdraft here, but where's the tornado? And in fact, we don't get a tornado in this case either, because right at the ground, the vorticity once again has gone horizontal. It, it's not vertical. It, it's vertical over here, but right at the surface, it's horizontal. So the, the problem with this mechanism is that we don't have any effects of temperature gradients included. So this baroclinity neglected here means that we're assuming that these vorticity vectors simply follow the trajectories. And uh, one term that will pop up later that I haven't introduced just yet, uh, some of you may be familiar with it, others might not be, is the concept of a vortex line. A vortex line is just a line that's uh, everywhere tangent to the vorticity vector. So uh, this blue line here, it's a trajectory, but it also represents a vortex line because it's tangent to the vorticity vectors everywhere along its point. Uh, so a vortex line is to the vorticity vector field. It has the same relationship that a streamline would have to the wind field. All right, well, here we have a downdraft, which we might have guessed would be needed since an updraft alone we showed couldn't make a tornado. If we make a downdraft, maybe that could make a tornado, but not in this case, because without baroclinity, the vorticity vectors just follow the trajectories. In other words, the vortex lines are the same as the trajectories. So we get horizontal airflow and horizontal vorticity right at the ground, but no intense vertical vorticity. But what if we include the effects of temperature gradients? After all, uh, if there's a downdraft in the first place, there almost has to be a temperature gradient. So we're looking at the same case now of a downdraft trajectory, but we're going to include a temperature gradient. So this del HB, B here, is just a buoyancy variable. You could think of it as temperature. You could think of it as the combined effects of, of temperature as well as water loading from the rain that might be in the precipitation region of a storm. And this X here means that it's, it's pointed uh, into the page. So the, the warmest or most buoyant air is into the screen. The coldest air is out of the screen. And this blue trajectory now, we could maybe think of this as representing this yellow trajectory in the hook echo of a supercell. So it's air that's kind of flowing along the left side of a rainy downdraft along this edge of the precipitation region. So if you're looking to the left of that parcel's trajectory, it's warmer here where the updraft is. If you look to the right of that parcel's trajectory, it's colder air or more uh, negatively buoyant air. So that's consistent with what this uh, gradient direction is showing here in the vertical cross-section. 
All right. Well, along this trajectory now, instead of these vorticity vectors simply being tipped downward like they were in the case without the effects of baroclinity included, when you include baroclinity, there's this constant generation of baroclinic vorticity uh, in the direction of this magenta arrow. So baroclinic vorticity generation, this is the effect of, uh, of generating spin about a horizontal axis when you have fluids of different densities side by side. So warm air has a tendency to rise when it's next to relatively cold air, and cold air has a tendency to sink when it's next to relatively warm air. So that generates horizontal spin, and the horizontal spin is oriented in this direction. Uh, it would be easier to, to show this if I could, if you could see what my hands are doing right now. But uh, if you can imagine putting your thumb parallel to this magenta uh, baroclinic vorticity generation vector, your fingers now would uh, if I'm on your right hand, that is, your fingers would give the sense of spin that's generated baroclinically by virtue of the fact that it's warmer into the page and colder out of the page. So that continuous effect of baroclinic generation of vorticity, what that ends up doing is it causes the vorticity vector to get lifted off of the trajectory, it's tugged off of the trajectory, and that allows the vorticity vector to become inclined toward the vertical as the trajectory bottoms out of the ground. So now we have a mechanism for having rotation about a vertical axis right at the ground. So this contrasts with the case without baroclinity. So it can be said that uh, a necessary condition for tornado formation is a downdraft as well as vorticity, baroclinic vorticity generation encountered along that descending trajectory. Uh, so this is a bit like uh, an airplane, uh, what it does when it lands. So out here, the airplane is kind of horizontal. Then as it descends to the ground, essentially its, it's nose tips downward early in the descent. And then as the plane nears the ground, the plane is still descending, but the nose flares upward. So that's exactly what the vorticity vector here is doing. Now, of course, the airplane hopefully doesn't do that when it reaches the ground. But at least for the early part of this trajectory, um, this is more or less what's going on. All right, so what are we still trying to learn? So uh, one question that I've posed is, what are the relative roles of environmental vorticity versus storm-generated vorticity? So what I mean by this is that we, we know that wind shear in the environment of the supercell, which implies horizontal vorticity in the environment of the supercell, we know that that's there. But I just showed you that you also have to have, in order to get a tornado, you've got to have baroclinic vorticity generation to lift those vortex lines or vorticity vectors off of the trajectory. So you have to have both environmental vorticity as well as storm-generated vorticity. So what are the relative roles? Uh, one conundrum we have is that when you look at climatological studies, there's a very strong signal in the environmental low-level shear. So environmental shear is what a sounding would measure, or it's what you would get from uh, say, a, a, a ruck analysis. That, that, that's, that's not the vorticity in the storm. That's the vorticity in the storm's environment. There's a strong signal for that being really large in tornadic supercells. Now, obviously, all supercell environments have fairly large shear compared to non-supercell environments. But when we say large, low-level shear here, we mean even large by supercell standards. This is a box and whiskers plot from the Thompson et al. 2003 climatological study, and there's not perfect separation between significant tornadic supercells and non-tornadic supercells, obviously. If there were perfect separation, then there'd really be no forecasting problem, and you probably wouldn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. So there's some overlap, but still, uh, this shows that there are differences in the distributions of, of the low-level storm relative helicity, which is related to the environmental horizontal vorticity. It's quite a bit larger on average in the environments of significant tornadic supercells, so the ones that make EF2 and stronger tornadoes, compared with the non-tornadic supercell environments. The 50th percentile value is uh, in the significant tornadic supercell environments is bigger than 
uh, more than 75% of all the values in non-ternetic supercell. But theory and simulations tell us, as I showed you on the previous slide, we have to have baroclinic vorticity generation, and we need downdrafts. And these are things that have nothing to do with the environmental shear. This is something different. So one might actually wonder, well, how do we actually do so well in predicting supercells using environmental data when we know that what's going on in the storm scale is so essential, downdrafts and, and baroclinic vorticity generation, that is. And when we look at observations of vortex lines, which are pretty easy to observe, actually, if you have three-dimensional wind data, which we can get not from ADAD data, but in field projects with dual Doppler analyses, we can construct uh, the vortex lines. This is what they look like in general in supercells. We have environmental vortex lines in the far field that kind of go up. They rise gently into the mid-level mesocyclone. And then the near-ground mesocyclone ends up comprising these vortex lines that actually emanate from the outflow or the cool air in the storm. And they get tilted abruptly near the surface and then kind of arch over this way, and then they descend over here, which implies anticyclonic vorticity over here. So uh, we, we tend to see an anticyclonic and cyclonic vorticity couplet that straddles the hook echo and the rear flank downdraft region. We see this time and time again. This is very strong circumstantial evidence for the importance of baroclinic effects. And uh, this is consistent with the theoretical considerations for the importance of baroclinic effects, which I argued uh, one slide earlier. So how do we uh, make sense of these competing roles? And if we look at, uh, in comparing this vortex line figure to the previous slide, what we're looking at here is kind of a vertical slice through the region of cyclonic low-level vertical vorticity. So that's what we were looking at at the previous page. If we were to take a slice through the anticyclonic side of the vertical vorticity, this figure would look similar in the sense that it would have a downdraft descending to the ground, but the direction of the baroclinic vorticity generation would actually be pointing the opposite direction, and that ends up leading to vorticity vectors that are pointed downward at the surface, which implies anticyclonic vorticity. All right. Second conundrum here related to this question is that Theory and simulations tell us that baroclinic vorticity generation and downdrafts are required for the development of rotation next to the ground, and observations of these arching vortex lines are indirect evidence of the importance of that storm-generated vorticity. But when we actually look at the strengths of cold pools and supercells, we find that tornado formation is much more likely when the cold pools are weak. So. This is actually pretty paradoxical, because I just spent the last five or ten minutes saying, you have to have a downdraft, you have to have cool air somewhere to generate baroclinic vorticity. That's really critical to get those vorticity vectors to tip upward off of the trajectory, so that when the trajectories bottom out at the ground, you have vertical vorticity. But when we actually drive these silly vehicles around with their uh, instrumentation, uh, and, and, and Al Patrika was, uh, played a big role in collecting a lot of these data. What we see are uh, the cold pools of tornadic storms, on average, tend to be not nearly as cold as those in non-tornadic storms. The colors here are temperature perturbations relative to the environment. Here are a couple of uh, tornadic storms. Somehow the date got stripped off of this one. I'm not sure which case this is. Uh, this is a famous case from the Vortex 1 project. And these non tronic storms here, also from the first Vortex project, are much cooler. Uh, the, the black line, by the way, if you didn't figure it out, it's the outline of the hook echo. All right, so we know that baroclinic vorticity generation is important, but uh, it's kind of strange that the stronger the cold pool is, the less likely it is to get a tornado. I guess we can reconcile that maybe as saying that just because you say something's critical doesn't mean you're saying that you want as much of it as possible. Maybe we can make the same arguments about, uh, uh, this is a pretty lousy analogy, money. I guess you need some money to uh, not be totally destitute, but maybe too much money is corrupting. I don't know. That's not a very good fluid dynamics analogy. Maybe uh, I'm shooting we'll from the, the hip money. here, and I can't. I, what's that? We'll take the money. 
<laughs> okay. I, I can't see people's faces. That's the disadvantage of this mechanism. So I don't know if people are throwing stuff at the screen at this point or not. Um, I mean, another experience you probably are familiar with is, is with shear. I mean, everybody knows you need to have some wind shear for good storms, but if you've ever seen a case of too much wind shear, this, the updrafts just kind of get shredded apart. So it, uh, th there are lots of examples we could probably come up with if we thought about it harder where saying something is crucial isn't the same as saying you want as much of it as possible, and I think that seems to be the case with baroclinity here. You have to have some of it to get that vorticity vector to lift off of the trajectories, but having too much cold air seems to be detrimental. Another question, and this is a big one, is uh, what triggers near ground rotation is sometimes subtly intensified to tornado strength. What I mean by that is that even in tornado outbreaks, all of the storms aren't tornadic, and even the ones that are tornadic aren't tornadic all of the time. This is an example from uh, a rare fall tornado outbreak in Oklahoma, and I could probably cherry pick other tornado outbreak cases as well where uh, these were big tornado days, but if you look at a snapshot of the radar display at any given time, most of the storms are actually not making tornadoes at this time. The T's are the tornadic storms, the ends of the non-tornadic storms, and a lot of the non-tornadic storms are supercells, in fact, uh, long-lived supercells. So um, these are, are challenges. Uh, I'll comment on some of these challenges near the end of the talk. So now moving on to kind of the meat and potatoes of the talk. So the Vortex 2 deployment on uh, the 5th of June 2009, again, this was, uh, the, I think, the best case in Vortex 2, and that almost certainly makes it the best observed tornadic supercell uh, of all time. Uh, the color shaded areas here, regions where we have what are called dual Doppler observations, these are the radar trucks, and uh, in the shaded circular regions are where uh, Beams from multiple radars have suitable geometry from which we can retrieve the three-dimensional wind field. So we see that the storm uh, developed just on the edge of one of our dual Doppler lobes, and it basically moved right through the gut of our dual Doppler data collection. This is really a textbook deployment. Uh, the tornado formed right about here and moved right through uh, the dual Doppler network. It looks like it hit. DAL-7, and in fact, uh, it would have hit DAL-7. DAL-7 had to move at the last second to avoid being hit by the tornado, which made a, a sharp right turn near the end of its life and basically moved right over the location where the DAL-7 had been deployed uh, an hour before the tornado got there. That was a heck of a forecast, actually. They, they picked the spot of the tornado passage an hour ahead of time. So that's something... I uh, expect all of the forecasters and the weather service to be able to pull off as we go forward uh, in the future. All right, so what I've been working on for the last couple of years, well, I've actually moved on now to some other things, but uh, what basically occupied two or three years of my time dating back to uh, the 2010 to 2012 period was focusing on this period of the storm evolution right before the tornado got there. A lot of people focus on the tornado period but I actually think some of the most interesting things are right here, uh, just before the tornado formed. Here's uh, radar imagery. I think these are from DAL-7, actually. Uh, it looks like the tornado is kind of hitting right toward the radar. The radar is right here where my cursor is. Yeah, this must, these must be the DAL-7 data right before they bailed. Um, so you can see the, the tornado right in there, pretty intense couplet in the velocity data on the left. So. Uh, when we have two radars scanning the same area, we can perform these so-called dual Doppler wind syntheses. And this is one such wind synthesis. So T minus 22 minutes here means that 22 minutes before the tornado formed. These dual Doppler analyses, the first few in, in the sequence I'm going to show, are actually by combining DAL-7 with the KCYS-88D. So, uh, the ADAD data are really valuable. They're certainly research grade. They're not perfectly synced uh, with our field project scanning. By synced, I mean uh, we're not coordinating the scans where we take slices at the same altitude at the same times. But um, that's okay. It was, it was still good enough to compose the 3D wind field. What we're looking at here in this cross section is reflectivity, which is probably obvious. This is a developing hook echo on the storm. 
We're looking a little over a kilometer above the ground. The black contours here are isovorts. That's where the strongest vertical vorticity is. And the blue vectors are dual Doppler wind vectors. And you might be wondering why there aren't any up here. Well, this is because the geometry up here to the north didn't allow the retrieval of the wind. And that's because uh, either the dowel beam and, uh, or that must be because the dowel beam and the KCYS beam, which is coming from the far west or the far left here, they must uh, not have a very big angle between those two crossing beams. So we can't retrieve the winds up here. But down here we can. What's shown here on the right is a time series of, uh, uh, in blue is the time series of the maximum vertical vorticity, and in red is a time series of kind of the broader circulation intensity which you can think of as kind of an average vorticity about the center of rotation. Both of those are kind of steady in this period from uh, 2130 UTC to about 2142 or so. There's maybe even a slight decline, but it's kind of within the error bars. It's basically no trend. And then after about 2142, things really rocket upwards, both in terms of the maximum vorticity as well as in the the, the broader circulation intensity. As I animate this, hopefully this works well on your end, you'll see, in fact, there is this really strong ratcheting up of the intensity of the vertical vorticity as we get to 2148. This is just four minutes before the tornado formed. And uh, now we're also including the other Dow radar in the analysis. Um, let me animate this again. The green bar on the right is kind of moving through the time series, so you can map the, the time series trend to what you're seeing visually in a dual Doppler analysis. There it is. And this is a perspective you're maybe not as familiar with. This is now a 3D perspective of vorticity isosurfaces. The purple represents uh, essentially mesocyclone strength vorticity. This is 22 minutes before the tornado formed. This is the mid-level mesocyclone where I'm circling with my cursor. Uh, this black or gray isosurface inside of the purple one is really strong mid-level rotation. This separate purple isosurface is the low-level mesocyclone. So it, it's kind of developing near the surface first, and then it later grows upward and merges with the mid-level mesocyclone. The green is reflectivity. And yellow is anticyclonic vertical vorticity. And then these lines are vortex lines. The black and the orange lines are vortex lines to the low-level mesocyclone. And the blue lines are vortex lines through the mid-level mesocyclone. And the cyan line here is the gust front. So when we look at this from above, we see that vortex lines in the mid-level mesocyclone come from the environment to the south. They travel horizontally in the environment. And then they get tilted upward into the mid-level mesocyclone, just like what we saw on the first few slides that I showed you in the talk. And then these vortex lines that go through the low-level mesocyclone, these come upward out of the low-level mesocyclone and then arch over the rear flank downdraft and then descend into anticyclonic vorticity in a region that trails the hook echo. The hook echo, if I extended the reflectivity isosurface to lower values, it would kind of wrap around this way right through here. This is very similar to this diagram, which I showed earlier. So we see the environmental vortex lines arching upward in the mid-level updraft. And then there are these arching vortex lines over here. And these are the ones that are associated with the developing rotation near the ground. So I'll just kind of summarize the evolution schematically. This is what we were just looking at kind of 20 minutes or so before the tornado formed. Mid-level mesocyclone up here. A vortex line is shown schematically rising into it. Low-level mesocyclone over here. And then an arching vortex line connects the low-level mesocyclone with a meso anticyclone trailing the rear flank downdraft region. These black thin lines are trajectories. So notice that some of the trajectories on the outflow side of the gust front rise through that low-level mesocyclone and rocket upward pretty rapidly. And I'll say more about that later. That's actually a pretty important aspect of tornadic storms is that even though they're feeding off of this downdraft air, the downdraft air is actually still able to rise pretty high when it gets sucked up by the overlying mid-level updraft. As we fast forward through time at about T minus 12 minutes, 
by this time, now the low-level mesocyclone has kind of merged with the mid-level mesocyclone. We have a deep column of strong vertical vorticity. And then what happens at 2142 to 44, so this is now the time when we're starting to see rapid increase in low-level rotation. We see this thing which has been called in past studies a descending reflectivity core, or DRC. It's just a patch of anomalously high reflectivity. It first appears aloft in this case, uh, six to eight kilometers above the ground, and then it falls to the ground. And the formation and descent of that DRC to the surface is associated with this rapid increase in low-level rotation. And then it was just minutes later, four minutes after this time at the bottom right, when we had a full-fledged tornado at the surface. This broad blue arrow here shows where an occlusion downdraft eventually developed as well, which we would associate visually with the formation of a clear slot. So a little more on this descending reflectivity core. This is now a view of the storm from the backside. The pink is the updraft region of the storm. We can get this from the dual Doppler wind syntheses. And the green is the reflectivity, darker green is higher reflectivity, uh, lighter green is uh, 50 dBZ for what it's worth, the darker green was 55 dBZ. So there's this pulse of a new updraft that forms on the right flank of the supercell. If you've ever watched supercells, they're typically not these perfectly steady state uh, monolithic updrafts that move along, they typically have new cumulus congestus that form on the flanks and grow upward and merge into the main updraft tower. Well, in this particular case, we see one such updraft pulse forms on the right flank. We're looking kind of the direction into the screen here is the direction of storm motion roughly, so we're looking at this from behind. And this new updraft pulse, as soon as it kind of grows into the main tower of the updraft, uh, of, the, of the original main updraft, that's when this DRC reflectivity patch first formed. And then that descends to the surface like so. And it was then at this time when low-level rotation was really becoming quite intense. What's really surprising is how obvious this looks in radar data and how it almost looks like a smoking gun because it was right after this reached the ground that the tornado formed. When we look at this visually, it's virtually invisible. Uh, th this is a shot, uh, a, a video shot from the camera uh, located east-southeast of the supercell, so we're kind of looking toward the west-northwest here. This is the wall cloud. This would be just south of the wall cloud, and this is where the DRC was, and visually there's nothing there. So obviously what the camera sees is sensitive to attenuation or scattering by light, what a radar sees is actually related to backscattered radiation from microwaves that are transmitted by the radar. So they see different things, but it's kind of curious uh, to wonder, what does this imply? Well, maybe this high reflectivity here is just due to a few sparse large hailstones or a few sparse large raindrops. Uh, reflectivity is much more sensitive to big targets than the number of targets, whereas uh, how dark the sky looks or what you see visually is uh, more sensitive to how many particles you have, not so much the size. So the fact that visually this is basically transparent maybe suggests that this DRC is just a few large sparse hydrometeors. All right. So trying to tie some of the analyses we've done Vortex 2 to some of the questions I posed at the beginning, going back to this key question, what are the relative roles of environmental vorticity versus storm-generated vorticity? One tool that uh, atmospheric scientists can use is what's known as the material circuit approach. So first off, what is a material circuit? Well, what we mean by material circuit here is a loop of air parcels. Uh, I guess you only need three air parcels to have some closed loop. Uh, here, what I did was I had 10,000 air parcels that I made a big circuit with, and then I track this circuit backwards in time by tracking the individual trajectories of each one of these 10,000 parcels of air. And if I follow this circuit backwards in time, obviously it, it doesn't preserve its shape, it changes shape, it, it, it gets 
inclined in some areas and tipped downwards in others. Uh, we can actually learn some things about where the origins of rotation came from. So let me visit the bullets here on the left. So what I did was I introduced a, a circular ring uh, that's three kilometers in diameter, and it encircles the low-level mesocyclone. And then what I do is each of the air parcels that is in this ring, I track it backwards in time. And that allows me to kind of see where this circuit goes as we go backward into the past. And one important dynamical principle is that the circulation about that material circuit. So what circulation is, uh, mathematically, it's the integral of V dot DL. Well, what the heck is this? So DL is a little line segment that's tangent to the circuit. And V dotted with that would be just another way of saying we're interested in the velocity component that's parallel to that circuit. And if we add up all those individual velocity components at every point along the circuit, that's what gives us the circulation. So the bigger that integral is, is the, is the bigger the circulation. So if we look at the circuit kind of at its starting point when it's the circular ring, and I'll, you know, once I can show you graphics on the next slide, you'll have a better feel for what I'm talking about, hopefully. This circuit initially surrounds the mesocyclone. The circulation about that circuit you can think of as being related to the average vertical vorticity enclosed by that circuit. So it's kind of like a measure of the bulk uh, rotation associated with the mesocyclone. One important dynamical principle is that as we track this circuit backwards in time, its circulation can only be changed by baroclinic effects. This is, uh, it ultimately comes from Bjorkney's theorem, which you probably learned about years ago and in in your first undergraduate dynamics class, and maybe at the time you were wondering, is Birkney's theorem actually ever used for anything at all? <laughs> well, actually, we can use it for mesocyclone studies. That's one application. And it turns out, then, if we track the circulation of the circuit, we can infer something about the bulk contribution of the mesocyclone's rotation from baroclinic vorticity generation. And we can compare that to the circulation that the circuit has from environmental vorticity. And this is one way of quantifying the answer to this question at the top left. What are the relative roles of environmental vorticity versus storm-generated vorticity? All right, so let's look at this here. So here at the top left, this is the top view of this material circuit at different times. Each colored loop here is the circuit at four-minute intervals. So it starts out here at 2148 UTC, which is the time right when this mesocyclone is just about to make a tornado. So we surround it with 10,000 parcels. I've labeled every uh, hundredth parcel or so with a letter, so they're evenly spaced about the circuit. And as that circuit goes backwards in time, way out here, 16 minutes earlier, notice how deformed it is. It's got kinks and wiggles in it, and some parts of the circuit are higher than others. Uh, 1.21 here is the altitude in kilometers of the circuit. Uh, if we look at this three-dimensionally, uh, the circuit, parts of it are low, parts of it are high. And what we can see uh, visually is that, I, I believe this is, is it Gauss's theorem or Stokes' theorem? I always get the two confused but because they're related. One way to visualize circulation is if we take a, if you take a thin membrane and stretch it over the material circuit, the vorticity vectors that would pierce a hole through the membrane, that is what's related to circulation. So the, the, the stronger the circulation is, it means you have a lot of vortex lines piercing that surface that would be stretched over the material circuit. So if we zoom in here on what I'm showing you, at the initial starting point of this material circuit is horizontal, but the, it surrounds the strong mesocyclone, which has vertical vorticity. So the vortex lines are oriented with this orange vector. They would pierce the material circuit's surface. If we go backwards in time, way out here, this red loop is the material circuit 16 minutes earlier. It actually has a surface that has a vertical projection to it, and it would be pierced by horizontal vortex lines out here. 
So as the circuit goes backwards in time, it acquires a vertical projection as part of the circuit goes back into the cold pool of the storm. And that vertical projection intercepts horizontal vorticity that's being generated baroclinically by the storm's horizontal temperature creep. And changes in the circulation about this curve are then related to changes in the amount of baroclinic vorticity that's being generated in a way that it can pierce the surface that's defined by the membrane that you'd stretch over this uh, complicated frame. All right, so what's shown in the top right now is the circulation about the circuit as a function of time as we track this circuit across the storm. And one thing to notice is that there's a tremendous jump in circulation from about 2136 to 2140 about the circuit. That corresponds to when the circuit is in this region right here. This is in the forward flank baroclinic zone of the supercell. This is a region where there's cool air to the north, warm ambient air to the south. So there's a lot of baroclinicity in this region. And this, not surprisingly, is where most of the circulation is acquired by the circuit. Another interesting thing is that the circuit, as it goes way out here into the far field, its circulation basically drops to zero, which implies that way out here, the circuit has no circulation about it, which is another way of saying that the environment of the storm actually did not contribute anything to the rotation about this circuit. All of the rotation about the circuit has come from the baroclinic effects in here, and then by the time the circuit gets to its final stop, it still has that circulation, but then the vorticity ends up being amplified by stretching, which is ultimately what gives you the tornado in here. But the punchline is that the circulation or the bulk rotation about this circuit, none of it comes from the environment, which is really surprising because the environment has large shear. We said that supercell environments have large shear on average, and tornadic supercells have even stronger low-level shear on average than even your garden variety supercell environment. But yet that vorticity, in this case, doesn't seem to actually be playing any direct role in the rotation of the low-level mesocyclone. So, Storm-generated vorticity appears to be the dominant contributor to the Goshen County storms, low-level mesocyclone circulation, and the environmental vorticity's contribution to the low-level mesocyclone circulation is negligible. And that's despite of the fact that the environment has strong low-level shear. So then the million-dollar question is, well, then what was the role of the environmental vorticity in this case and in others in general? We know from these climatological studies that environmental vorticity is pretty important for tornadic supercell. There's a strong signal in the climatology. So what was its role? Was it indirect? So one way of kind of getting at a possible role for the environmental vorticity is to look at trajectories. And we already looked at trajectories of the, of the parcels that comprise the material circuit. Now what we're doing is looking at trajectories integrated forward in time, not backwards in time. And all the color trajectories here are trajectories that pass through the low-level mesocyclone in the Goshen County Vortex II storm. Look at how they rocket straight upward. They shoot right through the top of our data domain, up past five kilometers. They go way up to mid-levels and beyond. That seems to be a typical trait of tornadic supercells. If we contrast that with non-tornadic supercell trajectories, they go up through the low-level mesocyclone, and then they kind of just stagnate and then descend. They never make it to mid-levels. They never really participate in the mid-level main updraft of the storm. So what can we learn from that? Well, the fact that the trajectories rise implies that the upward-directed vertical perturbation pressure gradient force, VPPGF, exceeds the negative buoyancy. All right, well, what's that mean in English? So here's the vertical momentum equation. This is what controls accelerations of air upward and downward. If you make dW dt, which is the vertical acceleration, if you set that equal to zero, you have hydrostatic balance. So in hydrostatic balance, then the buoyancy would be balanced by the vertical perturbation pressure gradient force. The fact that the air in the tornadic supercells rockets upwards so quickly implies that dWdt is far from zero. In fact, it's very largely positive. Well, the only way this can be really positive 
is if the right-hand side is positive. But we know that this air is negatively buoyant because it's air that's come from downdrafts. It's air that's descended. So the buoyancy here is slightly negative. Well, the only way that DWDT can be large positive if B is negative is if this term here is a big positive. So this is the, the perturbation pressure gradient force. This you might refer to as kind of uh, casually, you could think of it as dynamic sucking. Supercells have really strong dynamic sucking. If you've ever seen a supercell, it has those laminar striated bases. That's visual evidence of forced ascent of of air that would not rise on its own. It's, it's forced lifting of negatively buoyant air. This is what makes supercells really special compared to non-supercells. Non-supercells don't have a very strong dynamic sucking effect, but supercells have very strong sucking. So if the sucking can really, uh, be, if, if the sucking can exceed the small negative buoyancy, then you get this outcome. If the sucking effect can't exceed the negative buoyancy, then you get this outcome weak accelerations upward. In fact, air stagnates and then kind of just accelerates horizontally somewhere else. So we can actually infer that in the tornadic storms, one of two things must be true. Either the negative buoyancy can't be too large, in other words, the air that's cool can't be too cold, or the dynamic sucking's got to be really strong compared to the non-tornadic storms. And in fact, in most cases, it may be a combination of both. Here's the Here's the surface analysis from these instrumented automobiles in the Goshen County storm. So it's a bit cooler. What's plotted here is potential temperature. It's, it's Kelvin, so you might not be used to seeing values like this. But air up here in the coldest part of the storm is only about 4 degrees colder, maybe 5 degrees colder than the ambient air. And in close proximity to the developing tornado, the air is actually only a few degrees colder than the ambient. This is usually a good sign for a storm that potentially could make a tornado. A good sign in the sense that a uh, tornado is favorable. Uh, obviously, this is not a good sign for most people in the public. This here is the sounding. Uh, if we take parcels of air from this downdraft and plug them into the sounding, yes, they're negatively buoyant at low levels. They have to be dynamically sucked upward. They would not rise on their own if you plug them into the sounding. But if you pull them up high enough, they do eventually have a level of free convection, and they still have cape, even though they're downdraft parcels. So uh, everything we're seeing in the mesonet data here is consistent with the possibility that air, in fact, is being dynamically sucked upward to give rise to trajectories that look like this. So. The emerging idea, this is based in part on the Goshen County storm, but also on idealized numerical simulations, which I've been doing in parallel to my Vortex 2 work, which is for a different day, not today, uh, is that the environmental shear intensifies the vertical pressure gradient force. So the stronger the environmental shear is, the stronger the dynamic sucking, and the combination of that strong sucking with uh, air that's only slightly negatively buoyant and has a lot of circulation, a lot of potential to be contracted into an intense small-scale tornado. This increases the odds that we can produce a tornado or amplify vertical vorticity via stretch. So going back to this figure from about a half an hour ago showing the evolution of the vorticity vector along a trajectory, if the downdraft air is too cold for the given level of sucking, then air only rises a little bit, and in fact, there's maybe some compression of the vertical vorticity as air decelerates as it goes upward. So the vertical vorticity actually doesn't grow to extremely large values. If the downdraft air is only slightly cold and or there's a really strong dynamic pressure gradient force, then the air rockets upward. This is the tornadic case of trajectories shooting straight upward. And that acceleration upward is also associated with intense stretching. And the magnitude of that vorticity vector, which is related to the intensity of the spin, that vorticity vector lengthens accordingly during the ascent of the air. I think this maybe explains finally why low LCLs and strong low-level shear end up being the best discriminators for tornadic supercells. So, here, the red dots are tornadic cases. The blue dots are non-tornadic cases. All these dots are actually supercells. What's plotted on the 
abscissa is LCL height. So over at the far right, we have high LCLs, which implies low relative humidity. Over on the left, we have high relative humidity or low LCLs. And on the ordinate, we have low-level shear. So all these cases have strong deep layer shear if they're supercell cases. But the low-level shear here is over the lowest kilometer. That actually separates a lot of the tornadic cases from the non-tornadic ones. As we head toward the upper left in this parameter space, in other words, toward low LCLs and strong low-level shear, the odds of having a tornadic supercell are much better than the odds of non-tornadic supercell. And you might be thinking, well, there's a lot of overlap here. I see a lot of blue dots up here, a lot of red dots down here. And in fact, that's true, which is just another way of saying that LCL and low-level shear don't control everything. They certainly account for a lot of the variance between tornadic and non-tornadic storms. It may be even the, about the best we can do in terms of discriminating between tornadic and non-tornadic environments. This is what the SPC folks are looking at. But it's not foolproof. Even on tornadic supercell outbreak days, not all of the supercells are tornadic. So low LCLs and strong low level, level, strong low level shear is a big part of the story, but they're not a, a guarantee of tornadic supercells. There are a lot of other things potentially going on on small scales that we can't observe. But uh, still, the, the signal here, I think uh, we can explain it as being related to this need to kind of match uh, weak outflow, weak cold pulls, and strong sucking. The ordinate here is related to the sucking effect. As we go upward, we get stronger sucking. As we go from right to left, we have weaker cold pools because the cold pool strength is strongly modulated by the amount of evaporation that can occur. That's directly tied to the LCL height and the relative humidity of the environment. So what are we still trying to learn? There was the second question I posed. What triggers near ground rotation is sometimes suddenly intensified at tornado strength? Well, in this case, we have this DRC that sure looks like it might have been a trigger for tornado formation. What was its dynamical role? Well, to get at this, I resorted to the material circuit approach once again. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to go through all the details uh, as I did before. We're actually kind of nearing the end here. But I, I wanted to show you that, that the first material circuit we looked at, I dropped it into the data domain I have right at before tornado formation happened. Then I dropped the second circuit into the domain right before the DRC got there. And the idea here was to compare the, the circuits and the circulation about them before the DRC formed and after the DRC formed to kind of get at this question of what role did the DRC have. So circuit A is the circuit we looked at before. This is the one that we tracked after the DRC arrived. Circuit B is the one that arrives on the low level mesocyclone just before the DRC gets there. And if you look at the circulation tendencies of these circuits, circuit A, its circulation actually increases as the circuit converges upon the low level mesocyclone. Circuit B's circulation actually was even higher than circuit A's at one point, but as it nears the mesocyclone, its circulation drops precipitously. So it's, and this is before the DRC got there. So it seems as though the DRC is having some effect whereby it's causing the circulation to, to, if not be boosted a bit, at least be maintained, whereas without the DRC, something's happening as these circuits get very close to the mesocycle and they're kind of bleeding off a lot of their circulation. If you look at where these circuits have come from, uh, the dotted lines here show the tracks of individual parcels that comprise the circuit. Circuit B, which is the pre-DRC circuit, many of its parcels have come from way out here in the southeast to kind of end up in their final resting place around the mesocyclone, whereas circuit A, all of the parcels have kind of been forced to be channeled through the forward flank of the supercell where the strong baroclinic generations occur. So one role of the DRC, we believe, is that it basically pinches off air from the inflow. Air from the inflow is air that would not produce vertical vorticity from tilting. Remember, the only air that can have strong vorticity next to the ground, vertical vorticity that is next to the ground, is air that's descended and passed through a downdraft. So bringing in air that's come from the inflow, which is not downdraft air, that's not good air to contribute to the spin about this low-level mesocyclone. 
So we think that this DRC effectively blocks out, uh, it alters the wind field such that we end up blocking out air from the inflow that's very uh, inhibitive for near ground rotation and forcing air to come from the sweet zone of, of strong descent and baroclinic vorticity generation along the descending path. This is kind of a, I basically already said what's shown here in text. This shows schematically the evolution of the gust fronts in time following the formation of this DRC. So the, the green blob here is what the DRC looks like in the reflectivity field near the ground. It shows up as this little patch of reflectivity. It gets bigger and bigger, and eventually it kind of closes off or causes the gust fronts to occlude. And by occluding, we block out this environmental air. This is the air that that doesn't have any vertical vorticity next to the ground. We only allow downdraft air into the circulation. That is the air that has vertical vorticity next to the ground. And it's at this time when low-level rotation really ramps up and we subsequently get a tornado. So here's kind of a summary of what I think the field understands at this point. I'll call this the emerging picture of how a tornado forms. This is a supercell. Uh, viewed from the inflow side, looking off to the west-northwest, we can see the striations and the updraft. That's the mid-level mesocyclone. We have wind shear in the environment. Surface winds are to the back of the photographer here from the east-southeast. Winds above the surface are from the southwest or west-southwest. That implies horizontal vorticity of that sense. And that's kind of like the spin of a football. So a football has what's called streamwise vorticity. It's this axis of spin is aligned with the direction that the football would be traveling. That contrasts with a baseball, which has its axis of spin perpendicular to the direction you would throw it, unless you throw a slider, of course. And that vorticity vector associated with the spinning football looks like this. The black is the direction of the vorticity vector. The curled magenta is the sense of spin. Those vorticity vectors, again, they get tilted into the updraft. But again, as we said at the beginning of the talk, this can lead to rotation aloft, but not rotation at the ground, because air is rising away from the ground as it develops its vertical vorticity. Instead, what we need is a downdraft. And there's plenty of downdraft in supercells. Here we're looking at the dark precipitation core of the supercell. Air is gliding downward on a glide path like so. And there's also baroclinity. We said that was important. Well, there's baroclinity along the edge of the downdraft. That's why there's a downdraft there, because there's cool air in the cold pool, and there's warm air in the ambient environment. So vorticity vectors that follow that path are able to get tilted upward as they do so. And this is what gives rise to the rotation next to the ground. So there's two different areas of rotation, one aloft, one near the ground. They're there due to different dynamical processes. And eventually, the low-level rotation gets vected upward, and we develop one big column of vertical vorticity, at least in the tornadic storm. There goes the airplane. All right, so this is how rotation develops next to the ground. To actually get a tornado, you need to subsequently intensify that rotation next to the ground. And at that point, it's just the figure skater effect. Of course, non-tornadic storms have rotation next to the ground as well. So, so far, we haven't explained how you get a tornadic storm versus a non-tornadic storm. This, these processes here at the top left are going on in practically all supercells. Maybe some LP storms are the exception. Essentially, all storms have this. To get a tornado, you've got to further intensify this rotation next to the ground. So if the air is too cold and or there's weak sucking from above, then you just get broad rotation here. It's not intensified to tornado strength. But if the air is not too cold and there's also strong sucking from above, then we can readily lift this air. Remember the trajectories that shoot straight upward in the tornadic storm. If the air is too cold and the sucking's weak, then you get these non-tornadic looking trajectories where the outflow trajectories only rise a short distance before being accelerated out of the storm underneath the mid-level updraft without ever participating in that mid-level updraft. This is consistent with uh, these temperature fields that I showed you earlier. So there's this paradox we mentioned before. You need some baroclinic vorticity generation, but too much of it, too many 
too strong a downdraft and too strong an outflow appear to be detrimental to tornado formation. As far as the role of environmental horizontal vorticity, this is related to the sucking. If this environmental vorticity out here is too weak, then the mesocyclone you get at mid-levels ends up being relatively weak. And that means that it's not going to suck air up from below. So the, the stronger the spin is aloft, the stronger the low pressure is aloft, and the stronger the upward sucking. So weak sucking in the case of weak environmental horizontal vorticity. If we have strong environmental horizontal vorticity, like the climatological studies show, then we get really strong rotation aloft just above where this low-level rotation is developing. And that facilitates this sucking upward of the air and the stretching that goes with the sucking. And that can intensify the rotation next to the ground. Uh, don't really have much to say about non-supercell tornadoes or non-mesocyclone tornadoes. Uh, these involve pre-existing vertical vorticity. So in the supercell case, we can get rotation by tilting uh, horizontal vorticity. In non-supercell tornado environments, at least for the fair weather non-supercell tornadoes like water spouts and land spouts, there's often pre-existing, not often, I believe there always is pre-existing vertical vorticity like this, and we simply take the vortex lines and converge them, and in doing so, we make a tornado. And it's just essentially the figure skater process. We basically bypass uh, the downdraft and baroclinic generation process. We just skip right to the, okay, there's already rotation here at the surface, now how do we intensify it via stretch? All right, so to summarize what goes on in supercells, the baroclinic generation of vorticity along descending trajectories is the means by which tornado genesis ready angular momentum develops at the surface. But too much negative buoyancy is not favorable for tornado formation. And large low-level environment, environmental vorticity seems to play an indirect role in tornado genesis by promoting this sucking effect, which helps to intensify the vertical vorticity that's been developed via this downdraft and baroclinic vorticity generation process mentioned in the first bullet. As far as outstanding operational problems, I think at this point we're pretty good at discriminating between strong and violent tornado environments, and I intentionally emphasize the word environment because our ability to distinguish between what's going on in specific storms once they actually show up on the radar display, even in outbreak situations, is limited. I'll say more about that in just a second. Hold that thought. But I think we're pretty good at this. I mean, we're on the big outbreak days, there are often mentions of outbreaks in SPC outlooks three to five days in advance. On day one, we're sometimes early dismissing from schools. I mean, this is stuff that when I started grad school, it was unimaginable to me that we'd have that ability to do that. We still have, as of today, have essentially no ability to discriminate between weak tornado supercell environments and non-tornadic supercell environments, and perhaps never will. And the problem with that for you is that weak tornadoes can still be deadly. They can still make headlines. And I'm not really sure what uh, – uh, that, that's not really a, a science issue. Well, I can tell you that the science on that is that we can't do much. Uh, so uh, these are really hard questions, I think, for – um, warning decision makers, but the, the science has kind of hit a wall on this. I mean, even if we take a, a Doppler and wheels radar and position it a mile from the storm, uh, we can be fooled. I mean, this storm here is non-tornadic. It looks just like the tornadic circulation. It has this weak echo eye in the middle, spiraling rain bands, but there's no tornado in there. It's just a strong non-tornadic circulation. Whereas this thing here is a weak tornado. What's the difference dynamically between these two cases? There might not really be any dynamical difference uh, or very subtle, nothing that we could ever hope to uh, predict minutes in advance, let alone even perhaps discriminate in real time. Uh, another issue, and this is really the crux of a lot of the, the warning challenges, is that the resolution and or data horizon of our radar observations generally only let us see the broader scale tornado parent circulation aloft, so that mid-level mesocyclone. They allow us to see kind of this part. But it's this part here that's the, the part that can make the tornado, and this is not going to be observed well by 88D. So the dynamical process is responsible for the small scale near ground rotation, which is typically not observable by weather service radars, 
the dynamics between the, behind this rotation are fundamentally different than the processes responsible for the rotation aloft. We have a limited ability to say when or if a specific storm will make a tornado. Now, as I showed you, sometimes DRCs seem to trigger tornado formation, but we certainly know that a lot of DRCs don't, and there are almost certainly tornadic storms out there that occur without any obvious DRCs. And even when there is a DRC, what you see is very sensitive to which particular isosurface or reflectivity you happen to look at, and looking at things in 3D is, is often not really feasible in the short fuse warning environment either. So uh, yeah, when we have the luxury of taking two or three years to analyze a storm after the fact, we can slice and dice the dynamics of the DRC, and we found in this particular case it seemed to be important, but it's really hard to generalize with DRCs. Sometimes storms cross pre-existing boundaries, as you all know, and that can provide a clue, but even that, as you also probably know, is not foolproof either. So I think it's safe to say our ability to say something about specific storms is somewhat limited. Uh, our ability to say whether a particular radar signature is associated with a tornado is also limited. And if a tornado is occurring, we have practically no ability to give the public guidance as to the current intensity of the tornado. Uh, I mean, sometimes a spotter can tell you subjectively, yes, this looks like a really high-end tornado, or this one looks like a low-end tornado. but Really, I think in general, we have very limited, uh, perhaps even practically no ability to provide guidance about the tornado's current intensity. And the current intensity can change on time scales of, of seconds, really. So even if you had a report saying this looks like a fairly weak tornado, there's no guarantee that 60 seconds later or maybe 30 seconds later we weren't dealing with a vortex twice as strong as when the initial report came in. Uh, and as far as future intensity or expected duration go, uh, this is something that Yvette Richardson's working on. This is related to the tornado maintenance problem. It's very important operationally because not knowing how long we should issue a tornado warning for affects the size of the polygons. It affects how many people get warned, perhaps unnecessarily. So this feeds into the false alarm problem. And it's really hard to believe in some ways that the science side of things really hasn't been able to give any guidance to forecasters uh, as far as how long should a warning be issued for. I think kind of the default is 30 minutes, maybe in some offices 45 minutes, but there's really no scientific basis for that. Uh, I think there might be some low-hanging fruits for scientists to explore in terms of are there any environmental clues or radar clues that we have that can maybe tell us whether we should be issuing warnings on a given day for 10-minute tornadoes versus 30-minute tornadoes. I don't know. Yvette would have more to say about that. On the last slide, um, I'll leave this up here for a few moments so that it's archived. Uh, these are some references. Uh, so if you're looking for kind of a quick read, well, these maybe aren't quick reads, but uh, kind of the latest on, on some of what's going on with respect to Vortex 2 analyses, and, and these are papers that I mentioned specifically in, in the last hour that I've been speaking, this is where you can find them. So I'll end it here, and uh, thanks again for letting me join you this morning. Thanks, Paul. That was that was really, really good. Uh, before I open it up uh, here for questions, I got a text from Yvette. Uh, I don't know if she made it on or not. She, are you there, Yvette? I guess not. She was going to try to get on over by noon. In fact, that's probably her now, but uh, she's, uh, she's trying to get in on the conference call. So with that, um, before she gets on, um, we'll see if oh, we have any questions. I am on. Oh, very Hi. good. So you, you survived uh, your flight. Um, yeah, but the, um, the GoToMeeting web is just spinning. Somehow it's just saying it's waiting for it and trying to connect. So I'm not in on that part. Okay. Um, John Eyes, do you have any ideas? Hold on, I'll resend the links to her again to try it again. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry about that, Yvette. Uh, in the meantime, uh, anybody have any questions? We got we got a few. Um, we'll just take them one at a time. Hi, Paul. Um, a few questions on the DRC, since that seems to be pretty important. Is there much research going on to uh, where and how that's forming? And is there still any thought to if that if that contributes any vertical vorticity to the low levels? Uh, it's 
so these are good questions. So um, the DRC, uh, let me tackle the, the first part of the question. So first and foremost, the DRC looks to be pretty important in this Goshen case. Um, we know of other DRCs in other cases that have been important, but we know of a lot that that are false alarms as well. So issuing a warning based on a DRC detection, I probably would not advise it. I, I, I'm not sure that would be any better than just blindly issuing a warning when you see a hook echo. Um, and there, there's some papers by uh, Aaron Kennedy and Eric Rasmussen and co-authors that have looked at uh, climatologies of DRCs and uh, fossil arms versus which ones sub subsequently led to tornadoes. But I, I think it is safe to say if you, when you see a DRC, it could at least maybe heighten one situational awareness that, hey, this could be something that precedes low-level rotation intensification in the short term, say, next 15 to 20 minutes or so. Um, if it's possible to get spotter reports, that could be a good time to uh, keep them on the line to see what's going on. Um, but blindly issuing warnings for DRC detection is probably not a good idea. Uh, as far as what dynamical role they have, oh, I, I think you asked where they form or how they form. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I showed you the visual evidence of these. The, the one on the Goshen day was essentially invisible. so. Uh, I'm not even sure we know exactly what it is microphysically. We don't we don't have polar metric radar observations for this case, unfortunately. I think we can only speculate that it seems likely in this particular case it was composed mainly of, of large sparse hydro meteors. But other than that, we can't say a whole lot, and that probably means we can't say a whole lot about how it forms either. Uh, when you look at the high resolution dual Doppler wind fields aloft, boy, there's a lot going on. And it's really hard to kind of figure out just exactly how the reflectivity ends up in that area. Uh, I showed you that updraft pulse that maybe is what a coincidence, maybe it wasn't. There was this new turret that merged with the storm on the south flank, and then the DRC suddenly appeared. Was that a coincidence, or are DRCs often triggered by uh, periodic ingesting of, of new updraft turrets by the main updraft. Uh, these things are fun to speculate about, but I, I, I don't really feel too good about making a convincing argument one way or the other. Um, you asked about uh, the, the generation of rotation by these DRCs. It doesn't seem likely that they play a direct role in, in generating new baroclinic vorticity, like I showed at the beginning of the talk where we have this baroclinic vorticity generation that helps the vorticity vector get inclined upward relative to descending trajectories. And the reason I don't think it's likely that it plays a big role in that process is because air, by the time it gets to that region, already has, it's already crossed through miles of, of baroclinity. The DRC, it, it, the air is just whipping through there. It's just not experiencing those temperature gradients for very long. Um, at least that's my experience. For, uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking from the Goshen case. Are, are, would, are, is it possible to have any DRC that could maybe impact the vorticity generation in a big way? I suppose it's possible. Um, but my gut tells me what's more important for vorticity generation is actually the the, the longer period of baroclinicity encountered during the long passage of air parcels through the forward flank. They're, they're in contact with baroclinity for 15, 20, maybe 45 minutes in some cases as they kind of descend down that glide path. Um, one other kind of wild card here is that DRCs could be associated with sudden surges of, of momentum in the outflow. This might be tied to this blocking out of, of of low angular momentum air, which maybe facilitates tornado formation that seemed to be a plausible candidate for the Goshen County storm. Uh, and one other thing I didn't say anything about, which is something that's relatively unexplored, and some people are starting to touch upon this now, is that uh, there's the interaction of the airflow with the ground. 
that can generate horizontal vorticity frictionally. Um, that, that doesn't seem to be a process that could make a tornado if nothing else is going on, but it could certainly modulate the story that I told in, in ways that um, could be could be pertinent. So I don't think the jury is in on that one. Um, it's just kind of one of these things. Stay tuned for the next 10 years' worth of analyses and mainly modeling studies. I think it's going to require models to get at what is the role of frictionally generated vorticity near the surface. Thank you. All right, next question. Hey, Paul, it's uh, Evan Bookbinder here. How are you? Hi, Evan. Uh, a couple questions for you. One, it, it seems a lot of the research, at least in this specific case, dealt with uh, environmental shear and vorticity, mainly being a contributor to this vertical pressure gradient force. Maybe you didn't touch upon it in, in this context, but I'm wondering, Overall, what's that contribution to just precipitation distribution being you're going to get a supercell and you have strong low level and strong deep layer shear, um, really to the fact that you're enhancing your bare clinic zone along that forward flank downdraft and, and inflow region interface. And, and I guess a little add on that would be the vector of that such that, you know, is, is your low level mesocyclone taking advantage of that and moving across it? in such a way that you're utilizing that vorticity to, to the best way possible. Yeah, so you certainly, certainly the strength of the shear over the whole depth of the storm is going to affect, and the storm relative winds as well, it's going to affect where the precipitation falls out. Uh, so it's going to affect the location of baroclinic zones, how long they are, uh, but a lot of things, I mean, a lot of things go into that, not just the environmental wind field, but also the hydrometeor species, uh, as well as the environmental relative humidity. So there are a lot of things that control the details of the cold pool. My guess is that uh, the wind field alone, if you were looking at it in isolation, it kind of predict where bare clinic zones are and how long they are and how favorable they might be. Uh, my guess is that it's not going to do so well. He, 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 the, the totality of the, the, the cold pool issue is, is is enormous. There are a lot of things that control the cold pool details. Um, this is an interesting idea. I think you mentioned maybe if you have strong low-level shear, you have a strong uh, strong mid-level mesocyclone, or the, the base of the mid-level mesocyclone ends up being at a lower altitude and maybe that sweeps precipitation more around to the backside. It, yeah, I, I certainly can't rule that out. Um, I'd have to think about whether there was a way to test that idea scientifically. You probably want to set up some sort of idealized simulation study where you can kind of control one parameter at a time. But uh, yeah, the, certainly uh, there's a strong signal in the climatologies, and this has been found by a lot of independent investigators, it's extremely robust that tornadic supercells are favored when the low-level shear is, is strong, even strong by just ordinary supercell standards. And uh, in simulations, where I, which I didn't talk at all about, in simulations I can control the sucking effect solely by changing the low-level wind shear, and it's a really nonlinear effect, by the way. Um, you only have to change the low-level shear by a little amount, and you can change the sucking effect by an enormous amount. And uh, I, 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 I can essentially, just by tweaking that sucking effect in really simple simulations, affect um, the ability of that downdraft air to be sucked upward, and in, in getting sucked upward, the vorticity gets stretched uh, tremendously in the process to make a tornado, or not make a tornado in the case of weak environmental shear. Thanks. Yeah, that's very good points. Um, the other half of my question was kind of, Dan touched upon some of this related to the descending reflectivity core. I, I would agree anecdotally, we haven't seen much in the way of a yay or nay as to that making a tornado decision work, and you had said that dual pole data wasn't available uh, in that specific case. That seems to be a huge area of opportunity, perhaps, um, and, and I say that just from, from how that might alter the 
buoyancy, relatively speaking, of, of the whole RFD, you know, in particular. Um, you know, the case you showed up there, yeah, it wasn't visual. And, and you know, you'd have to argue, well, maybe, like you said, it was largely spaced tail, which would likely have the least amount of evaporative processes that would lend itself to a real strong cold pool. So that, that kind of makes sense there. It seems that, uh, you know, for future studies with rotate or I don't know what else is going out there, that, that might be something you really want to focus on is the hydrometeor aspect of what exactly is going on back there. Your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, we, we've, we've been looking at all sorts of things for decades. Uh, I mean, we're, we're past the point of just being able to take a radar at a storm, collect some wind data, and say, ah, you know, this storm is different for this reason. I mean, the things we're looking at are really subtle differences. Uh, some of these differences might only be able to be exposed even with really sophisticated data assimilation types of analyses, which one of our uh, postdocs here at Penn State is working on and some other people at Norman and at NCAR are working on. So we're, we're, we're looking for really subtle things. Uh, but one area that has, despite all the decades of observational studies of supercells, one area that remains relatively virgin territory is the, uh, the, the, the microphysical observation aspect, um, mainly indirect observations via radar. And uh, there might be a way to get some direct observations as well from uh, distrometers or penetration aircraft, although you're always kind of limited in, in sampling uh, only a few points with those direct observations. But uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if, if those will turn out to be really fruitful or not. Um, I think there's some early indications for some cases that they're finding some interesting things, uh, whether they'll be really robust differences that we can hang our hat on to actually improve warnings in a tangible way, I think we'll have to wait and see. I'm not sure. I hope so, but uh, I certainly would want to promise that. Any other questions? Hey, Paul. I just had a quick um, follow-up question to what you and Evan were talking about. Um, it seems like the environmental shear that's that's the key that we've been missing is how does the environmental shear relate to the tornado? And you know the the stuff that you found with your numerical simulations is is really new and really key. Um, is there a way to do like a backward trajectory analysis to find out um, if the parcels that are moving into the low level mesic cyclone and they're contributing to that VTPGF? Is there a way to find out if they're really not modified by the storm? If it's really all environmental, calculate the vorticity along that trajectory or is it just when I modify this, then this happens? Yeah, so the the trajectory calculations are in a simulation are way better than what you can ever do observationally. So these are gory details you probably don't care about, but I'm actually able to track things every tenth of a second. And every tenth of a second, or maybe it's two tenths of a second, it's a heck of a lot of data. And I can interpolate anything I want to the parcel. So I'm interpolating, I think, 30 different things, vorticity components, gradients of this and that, pressure fields, pressure gradients, buoyancy gradients. And you, you basically can get to the bottom of anything in a model. This is one advantage of a, of a simulation is that uh, you could do these sorts of quantitative calculations. And uh, yeah, it's the... Uh, the, the air that goes into these vortices, it's air that has a history of being in the outflow, that it's, it's experienced baroclinic generation uh, prior to entering the vortex. Parcels that come from the environment directly without flowing through the, uh, the outflow, uh, just they, 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 they cannot acquire large vertical vorticity next to the ground. So they, they cannot enter the tornado. The only ones that can enter the tornado are ones that have come through the alpha. There's actually a pretty cool uh, paper. It was in Monthly Weather Review, I think, uh, earlier last year, maybe last summer. I don't remember which. Uh, the authors are Johannes Dahl, uh, Matt Parker, and Lou Wicker. Um, they, there's a nice figure in there that shows trajectories from the inflow 
and they, they have an intense vortex at the time when they show all these trajectories, and the trajectories from the inflow basically just all hit the gust front and then go up and around the vortex. They actually never go into the vortex. Uh, the only parcels that go into the vortex are the ones that are behind the gust front. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, visually, it's a pretty compelling argument for the importance of downdrafts and outflow. Thanks. Okay, I got a question. Okay, I got a question. Um, and it has nothing, with all this talk of sucking, it has nothing to do with Kansas City Chiefs, believe it or not. Um, but if we're looking at the environmental shear and the mesocyclone contributing to sucking that really um, makes that non-buoyant air buoyant and gives us a tornado, is there any kind of rule of thumb? You know, as we're looking at stuff farther and farther away from the radar, we're looking higher and higher up in the atmosphere, is there, does, at what point are we looking too far up and the intensification of the rotation of the mesocyclone really doesn't tell you what's going on with the sucking close to the ground. You know, where, how yeah. far away? Right. Yeah, I don't, that's a, an excellent question. Um, essentially what you're asking, is there a way to use ADAD data to uh, kind of as a proxy to get at the intensity of the upward sucking and uh, I, I it, without thinking about it harder, I don't. I don't think so. Um, I mean, in a very, very hand wavy way, it, there you could maybe make some assumptions and kind of back out some information about that. But uh, I think uh, there's just too many things that are too many details you wouldn't be able to get past without making really crude assumptions. And I think you'd be kind of burned in the end. I mean, what you really need is uh, the, the vertical gradient of the square of the vertical vorticity. So one issue is you don't even have the vertical vorticity from ADAD observations. You, at best, you have delta V. So to go from delta V to vorticity requires one assumption. And then you need lots of observations in the vertical to estimate the vertical gradient of that. That's going to introduce other problems. And, uh, and then he, after all that's said and done, you still wouldn't know anything about the buoyancy characteristics of the of the low level air. So, yeah, that I mean, it would it would be awesome to have all those data, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, uh, this is kind of there's a gap here between kind of what we can say from science and what somebody in the hot seat at the warning desk is able to do. Makes me kind of wonder what they are able to do.